and everyone at home, morning as well. Hope you had a wonderful week that's passed. We are now at the Sunday, going into a new week, new challenges, new things to face with faith in God alone. That's the only way we can make it, with the mercy of God and His faith alone and His love towards us. Guys, I just want to make a few announcements. The first announcement is for the Home Spun ma- Market Day, That's which, which is on a Saturday, the 2nd of October. That's a Saturday coming. Um, it's from 9 a.m. to 12, yeah, 12 p.m. Not the night, then the day. Um, so um, I'm Afrikaans, so just excuse me. So I'm not. You can let him know that uh, in the youth will be doing the pancakes and and they will s- supply the uh, pancakes and the coffee at the day of the market day. So going on to the Christian movie marathon. Every Sunday evening of the month of October, there will be a movie marathon going on. So, um, so supper will be available from 5 p.m. and movie starts at 6 p.m. So, guys, make sure you're here early, like at 4 o'clock, everyone gathering before 5, so everyone can get supper and then everyone can enjoy a lacquer movie um, at 6 p.m. Okay, guys, and um, then the youth. It's again on the 30th of October, this first day coming from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. So, yeah, that's all from my side. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Be blessed. Amen. I think we're filling up with our Afrikaans people. Amen. One of these days, I'm going to have to speak in Afrikaans. That'll be fun. Do you have your uh, envelopes with you this morning? Oh, goodness. Our basket's there at the back. I'll bring it. Thank One, you. One, two, three. Praise Sound the check. Lord. <laughs> my, my right hand is back, so I can shout when I need something. I've uh, started this um, devotional on the Bible app, and it's called Jesus's Terrible Financial Advice. (laughs) Who would have guessed Jesus would give terrible financial advice? But you know what what I've realized is that it's everything opposite to what the world believes, right? The world says you go work, you make money, You put the money in the bank and you keep it all for yourself. And Jesus is saying, go do your work, but while you're at work, use that as a time for ministry. Minister into other people's lives. Tell them about me. Let them know that I'm there. And then when you get your pay at the end of the month for doing the work of the ministry, because we do everything as unto the Lord, amen, So when you get paid at the end of the month, the payment is not for you to hold on to. It's to give so that you can sow seed. We spoke about that last week. But when we sow seed, we also reap a harvest. And something about Jesus is he gave. Jesus was so generous that he gave his life. Amen? So something that really got... Uh, caught my attention and I just want to share a very small part of it is about wealth. I think over the last two years now um, going through lockdown and, and COVID and everything we've realized that wealth is not just money right having wealth means you have your family close by having wealth means you're you have good health Having wealth means you can still give when somebody else is going through a tough time, whether it's in your time or your finances or the food out your pantry cupboard, right? That is wealth. But there comes a thing with the world that wealth becomes deception. And we start to place far more importance on money being wealth than what God has blessed us with when we open up our eyes in the morning. And so 
in um, Jesus warns us that the de deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Now, there's two words in that small passage that I just want to touch on. The first one is the desire of other things. Okay? When we are desiring other things and not the things of God, we get distracted and we get wobbly. What, well, there's a scripture verse that says, uh, uh, I just want to quote it correctly. Um, a man that is not decided is like a, a tossed in the winds. Yes, Timothy, I'll, I'll find it, I'll send it. Okay, and the other one is the unfruitful, making the word unfruitful. So while we're being tossed in the wind, we cannot be decided about what God has in store for us. And it makes the word unfruitful because it doesn't matter how much you read your Bible and it doesn't matter how much I preach at you and it doesn't matter how much time you spend with people who are going to input the truth of the word of God into your, your heart. If you are not, if you haven't made a decision to trust, the word of God is unfruitful. So I want to encourage you this morning. If you are at home and you're not able to bring your seed, when our, our banking details are in the description box below, you're welcome to make uh, a donation or make a payment or make an offering or sow a seed there. But with the same intention that when you walk up and place the seed, that you do it understanding that I put my trust in God. When I put this money in here, it's not because I'm giving out of an abundance. Because let's be honest, how many of us have an abundance to give out of? Eh? We're giving because it is what God expects. And we're giving because we know that God is our source. Not our jobs, not our husbands, not our financial advisors, not our trust funds. God is our source. And so out of our blessing, and if that means the five rand that's in your wallet, out of our blessing, we can be a blessing. All right? And we are not going to get distracted by what the world sets as wealth. Our treasures are in heaven where moth and rust cannot get to them. So I want to encourage you this morning, when you're bringing your seed, bring it with a heart that is planting, not, not with ill intentions, but with obedience and trust and joy. Amen? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's close our eyes. Hold up your, your envelopes this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this seed. Lord, it might not look like a lot. It doesn't look like we can do much with it. But Lord, when we put it in your hands, it is more than enough to meet the needs of all that are, are in want and in lack and need you. Lord, we know that the gospel is not cheap, but Lord, it is free. And we want to give that good news to all who are willing to hear. Father, use this money, use the seed to the furtherance of your kingdom. And may it be a blessing. May each one who gives be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may bring your offering this morning. Now we're going to get our word in for the day. Um, Reno has an awesome vision of, I've, I asked him to take this one on because it's right up his alley. And I know, I know that if you just listen, 
you're gonna you're gonna get a whole new revelation of of who god is amen let's just stretch out our hands we're gonna pray and then we'll start heavenly father we thank you that you are going to use Raina this morning to speak your word, to speak your truth. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be soft and ready for you, ready to plant the seeds. Lord, and I pray that the harvest that will come out will be a bountiful harvest for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty, awesome, and wonderful name, amen. Amen. I'm allowed enough there. Can everybody hear me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess Lenina around in the back there to now and then do certain things for me. So just be patient with me. Let me get all the stuff out of my pocket and so on. I always said there's two scripture verses that, that is my favorite. Now one you often hear me quote about when Jesus says, I give blessings or cursings, life or death. But choose. And then God goes further and says, choose life. Because what's the alternative if you don't choose life? Death. What, what, what is the negative of if you don't choose blessings? Poverty, curses, whatever it could be. And sadly, we seem to live in a world that if you don't make a conscious decision to look for the good and the positive in life, the negative automatically comes. So it's not like, well, I won't choose anything and I will have glorious life and riches well beyond. To achieve those things take work. And then the other verse that's my favorite is literally Genesis 1 verse 1, because it says, in the beginning. And everything we read in this Bible and everything you experience and everything that you've, whether it's even sadness or happiness, loss, which not been a good year, so some of the families in that. It is, at the end of the day, it, although it is hard, still a blessing that you could experience this. Imagine if you just weren't there. Sadness is terrible, but we must always remember also the happiness of things. So when he said in the beginning, everything from Genesis 1 verse 1 became everything. Every word, every verse in this Bible comes from in the beginning. So to me, that's probably the most powerful scripture because every other scripture is written after that. So Lindin asked me to focus on creation and so on. And just to have a bit of a background, I really do love astronomy. I focus on it and so on. And there's a lot of <laughs> contradictions. How old this universe really is? It's six days or it was thousands of years. How old is the universe? Our biggest universe and all that. And sadly, sometimes people's eyes are very closed as well. Because when I take a telescope, I can calculate by the magnification. When I look at a thing, I can calculate because we know the distance from a sun. I can triangulate it to a specific thing and I can calculate how far that object is. It is some of those stars billions of light years away. But where did it all start? Let's see if this thing works. Not catching me. It's an infrared one, so you've got to push it sometimes. Okay. So when we read in John verse 1, and I'm not going to read from verse 1 like everybody likes to use it. I'm going to read from verse 2 to 3. It says, Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then can I ask you to put the church lights off? So what I want you to do now is I want you to close your eyes. Just waiting for, okay. Sorry for the camera people out there. It's going to be a bit dark. We'll switch on just now. And make sure the camera's on the wide shot. So, I want you to close your eyes now. Imagine the following. There was no light. 
no gravity, no matter. There was nothing for you to stand on. There was no time, no radiation, no lights moving around. There was just nothing. Even the fact that you can hear me, my voice talking, that voice was not there. Even when I tried to explain to you nothing, the word nothing, I can say nothing, but even nothing was nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then God said, In a fraction of a second, energy appeared that looked like light. God's light, because in the Bible it does mention at one point, I am light. You know, scientists figured out that there was a beginning. And it seems like at one point there was an intense amount of gravity and light that was smaller than about the size of an atom. And yet all the stuff that was needed to create life, all of it, all the light, all the matter that's going to need to be created came from that little speck. And that's when I realized that God's power is so big, that is so amazing, that when He took His own self, His light, and He took where His existence of living, and He decided, I will just prick a hole into another dimension, another existence, just by pricking a hole, it was enough, if you want to call it the awesome power of God, that that was enough of His light, of His awesome power, that could create a universe which we can look at today. Just a break. Try to start to understand how massive or how powerful God is. I laugh at people because a couple of years ago they figured out what they sort of called the Big Bang. They said they realized it was beginning. We don't know what was before it, but there was a start point and everything quickly came. Quarks formed. The beginning of the universe so hot. All that that you saw in the beginning happened in point zero 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 one seconds. There was that amount of energy that just had to get out. Atoms started fighting with each other. Matter and antimatter started fusing with each other. Matter fused, antimatter, explosions, violence, chaos. And then slowly, slowly, the weaker things start becoming able to exist. Electrons came around. Electrons was able to start connecting with neurons. And we had the first molecules that started happening, hydrogen. And from a hydrogen, stability started happening. And then they started eventually moving further apart from each other, and we could start seeing blue space. At that point, it was just light. You couldn't see past it. And from that, suns were built. They formed. Nuclear fusion happened. And suddenly, we started having stable planets, certain galaxies. And with these suns, eventually, from hydrogen, oxygen, and all these things started coming together. These suns would get so big and burn out the stuff, they would explode again. But because of the mass of its gravity, will pull together and will start creating heavier elements. Aluminium. 
and eventually even gold. And when these suns exploded for the last time and all the rocks formed and they came together and the new sun was born, we had a stable planet. Now sometimes people will say, oh, you know, science and that, and it's so like, you know, and it's, and, you know, all this stuff. And I say, why do you keep God so small? You see, because we think in terms of billions, because we link to a time paradox. As the universe existed, time started to exist. But in God, there's no time. I'll try to explain to you that or what it means to be outside of time. The point of having everything precisely where it needs to be to create that little planet that we call Earth. If you had to follow the amount of chance for it to happen by accident, I'm really, I'm like, guys, this can't be an accident. If, if, if you talk to a financial person, you talk to any person that does some type of calculations, even science, and you say the probability of something happening because the Earth exists, we're lucky we've got big planets like Jupiter. Jupiter has been able to get rid of a lot of bigger rocks that could have totally taken this planet apart. We have a sun that is stable for a couple of billion years, so it gives chance for this Earth to be stable. We are just at the right point where water can exist in a liquid state. We were lucky enough to have a moon just at the right place that we can create tides, so that we're not always just flooded with water, which at one point, as we read in Genesis, that was exactly the point. Because if we go to Genesis 1 verse 2, it said, it was chaos. The water covered the whole earth. Jesus separated them. And eventually also put the moon there because the moon made sure that the planets follow what God wanted the tender to do. That's why, of course, you go to Durban and you're going to have high tides and low tides. That's because of the moon. If you take all that in, in contrast, and lucky enough too, we don't have neutron suns. We care what you call a neutron sun, neutron stars. They have a high value of radiation. If we had one that was too close to us too, that would create so much radiation that, again, human life as we know it couldn't exist. And they're everywhere in the galaxy. But luckily, for some reason, there's not one close enough to affect our planet. Now, the chance of that happening by chance, like I said, if you, if you go to any other thing and you said 0. 0. 0. 0. how many ever zeros? I can't remember, I counted. One percent chance that this all happened by luck. Any other person would say to you, that figure is too low, you cannot use that as fact. Gee, it's like not even at least one percent. Imagine any of you, I say, I believe in something because I have one percent proof. You'll say to me, are oh, you crazy? But imagine I said to you, point zero 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 zero. I mean, ever one percent of this planet being precisely where it needs to be at all the planets with everything being right. You would tell me further, you are totally cuckoos. Yet there's some people who want us to believe that this was all an accident. And then always ask a question. Yeah, I have no problem that there was a start of the universe. We know there was a start. God said he made it. What put that energy there? Everybody has a theory, so I said, stop theorizing, I know it's God. I think about 20 years ago, when the Hubble telescope went up and it started getting these cool pictures and that, and I said, oh, we figured it out. There was a beginning, there was light and so on. I'm like, I knew that a long time ago. Moses then wrote that thousands of years ago. There is a translation, I need to find it again, because it was old translation Hebrew. It actually didn't just say God created heaven and earth. It said in the beginning was light, and everything was light. And out of that light, God made everything into existence. Now, if we think further about it, because here comes the question. Remember, it, it says, and God created, he separated the light from darkness, and it was day one, or night, and it was day one. But only a couple of days later, God created the sun and moon to start of this. And I always had this question. 
But I realized at one point when God created, because he said there was chaos of this planet. Not only did God not create the universe, because in the beginning the universe, like I said, was chaos. It was, it was explosions. It was fighting with each other. Other suns collided. It was explosions. There was, it was crazy. What is what God does that is like his speciality, if I can say it like that? God takes chaos and creates order. God takes hardship and sorrow and changes it into peace. God takes your bad circumstances, if you allow Him, and change it for the good. And people are often telling me, how does a loving God create all the bad things on the planet? I say, God doesn't. He's given you this planet to rule and reign. And he said, you choose where it goes. Again, I come to my verse. Yes, I said before you, blessings, cursings, life and death, you choose. So sometimes we fight, if the loving God was around, how would he allow AIDS? We said, well, the Bible made it very clear how to handle yourself when it comes to your sexual preferences. If you followed God's word, it would not have happened. Not God that brought it. Humans decide to go against God's word and brought it onto themselves. And then want to blame God or God's got to fix it. And if you believe in God and you pray hard enough and you're earnest, God will heal you. We moan about how bad governments are on this planet. Well, who chose them, God or you? Humanity can be very, be very stubborn. I mean, I follow politics often, and you do find that, like you say, we'll protest. We're not getting this, we're not getting this, we're not getting this. And next election, we vote the same people. Let's put us in that position. They don't want to blame God for this terrible place I'm living in. And that's why God says, pray for them. Because you're the ones who put them there. So either pray them in or pray them out to so do what you need to do. But you need to change the circumstances. So as we go on, why well, is it just gone black? Uh, okay. yeah, this thing doesn't work nicely. There's nobody in the back. Thought I'm going to walk up and down here. Uh, just push it down, key. I'm stuck. Yeah. So, just to get an idea, there's some of our planets. That's our solar system. And there you've got little Mercury. You can't even see it on this projector. It's a little dot there. And then the third planet, you see this little Earth. And this is about the, this is actually, this picture is scaled, not in distance, but the size of them compared to the sun. And you see how big the sun is? It doesn't even fit in there. On our little planet there. And Jupiter and Saturn at least gives it a bit of a go. And the weird thing with Saturn and that is that it's actually made out of gases, although it's a big, it said that if we had an ocean big enough like our sea, Saturn would float on it. Now keep that in mind now. So now we think, oh, sun is impressive. Our sun is big. I mean, and it is. Go to the next clip. And then suddenly we realized as we as Hubble telescope came out and we had better telescopes and we realized there is one sun. It, it went bright, brighter two years ago. It actually went dim. Nobody knew where it did it. It's too far. We can't really. And then it started going bright again. Some people thought it was losing it now. Nobody really knows why it's done that yet. And that sun was called Betelgeuse. Now you see that little that sun that shows Betelgeuse. You want to know how big Betelgeuse is? That's the size of a sun compared to Betelgeuse. That speck there. Let's go clip down, Regan. And our whole solar system as we know it fits in the galaxy and we sit around, I should have had a pointer here somewhere, a little speck. That's our galaxy we're in. 
And for a years, eventually, when Galileo and those guys figured out there was what we know as the Milky Way, when you look at the Milky Way, all you're looking is into our galaxy. And then we thought, that's it. It's, it's, it's huge. It's brilliant. God's creation is massive. Please, Regan. Sorry, I meant to just go back, please. Sorry. And from there to there, our galaxy is around 100,000 light years across. Now, let me try to give you an idea how big is a light year. Light travels around Earth eight times per second. It's quite fast. And yet, even with that speed, it takes seven minutes to reach the sun. Does anything have to happen with the sun? Our eyes will only see it seven minutes later. Okay, I can go down. Thanks. So when the Hubble telescope was put on and they fixed it, they had problems, then they decided we're going to look at the sky and we're going to focus at a spot. And one of the guys said, if you ever do astronomy, there is what we call sort of a, a black area. It looks like there's nothing that side. And I said, let's, let's try to look into that and see what we see. And the Hubble telescope focused its camera there for a while. And then suddenly, that's what it saw. And realize even for us, where we see the darkest points, each one of those is galaxies. And although it looks like so many, to give an idea how far apart the galaxies are from each other, the closest galaxy print that we have is called the Andromeda. And to give you a staggering thing, as close as you think all those galaxies look together, the closest galaxy by, from us is 2,570 2, million light years away. You're starting to see how big God is. Revelation 22 verse 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And remember too, at one point Moses sat with God and God explained to him what he must do. And then he said to God, who must I tell the Israelites you are? And you know, we've given God, God a lot of names. Abba Father, Jehovah Jara, Jehovah Nisi, and it goes on son. But here God says, tell them I am. That I am what I am. So when I started doing a little astronomy and so on, and we realized the size of the universe and so on, it can go one down, Regan. I don't know what I, if I put another, and oh, no, I didn't. Don't worry about it. Um, I started realizing that the size of everything is way behind what our brains can conceive. It, it really is. And you know, it's an interesting story. Lynn gave me a book one day I read, and it was a scientist, a nuclear physicist that actually was part of when they were doing the nuclear bomb testings in America. And his job was, after the explosion was done, they would calculate the damage and what happened, how much radiation is around. Then a the funny thing, his son decided to become a pastor, and he went to study theology. So now you can imagine, got a a Bible schooler son and a scientifically dad. But the dad said, you know what? Any good scientist will actually also go and do his research and not just, well, this is my opinion. Like any good guy should do research. And uh, eventually after researching with his son and that, and actually his son, he, he sort of always believed in God, but it didn't make it a big deal. You know, like a lot of Christians, you know, like Christians, real Christians, what did you do on bride day? Oh no, I was I was falling over. Dirty jokes, brying, so drunk swiss and matrus in it. Then we hear other countries going back. Now we'll pray to God, He will let us through. Wow, that's a little bit of blasphemy, I would say. Is your focus on God so that when you speak to God, you have a communication with God? So you see, so one thing you realize that's a problem with Christians. They seem to battle to understand and believe 
in a God Almighty with no limits. You see, in the older days when Galileo and those people found out that the universe seems to be much bigger, and eventually, like I said, we thought the galaxy was it. We found it, and it's big. I mean, 100, 100 plus thousand light years. And then eventually when Hubble went up, said, no, there's billions of these things. In fact, luckily from the Big Bang, or, or I want to call it the Big Bang, the creation, because of the radiation was left with certain infrared telescopes, you can still see the faint heat and we were able to figure out, you could still see some of the heat. The universe is just, just, just three degrees above absolute zero. Cold place. <laughs> and the, again, realize it came from one place. And it seems like, and that's a weird thing, just like a galaxy when it explodes, seems to be flat disks. The universe itself seems to be a bit Hubble, but it's a flat explosion that pushed out. And again, like he said, he says, you people always says, I've got the whole world, or he's got the whole world in his hands. You know that song? He's got the whole world in his hands. And eventually he says, again, how big then is God's hand to hold all of this creation? And he can let you hold it basically in the palm of his hand. Says we need to stop making God smaller so that we can fit him in our brains. The reason why we would like to make the universe smaller, because it's estimated to be about 13.8 billion light years across. And it's growing. Tomorrow it's bigger than it was today. It just expands. And then my question came expand into what? Because let's say I've got an object here. I don't know. Let's use this just a box. It's the universe. We're all in this. What's on the outside of this? Surely for this world to exist, there has to be some type of space on that side for this world to exist and maybe grow out. But surely there must be an end to this. You can't just have infinite and not stop. But it can't stop. Because if it stops... What gives the ability for this to be inside nothing that can't stop? But yet, we are here. So it is working like that. So again, our brains can't work at the physics of it. But yet the universe exists. So it is. So there's no way that God can explain this to us. And then we go back to creation too. And you know, the simple thing comes again. Okay, so Adam and Eve was made. What made Adam and Eve? God made it. And, some people, and then you get the other people who believe, no, it was from evolution. So I said, okay. RNA, whatever. I'll, I'll play your game. Where does that come from? No, when the Big Bang and all this happened, I said, okay, where did that energy come from? So our minds tell us that you need some type of something or substance or something to make something. I mean, really, I cannot make this phone without, I need some substance. We knew how to change it. And so exactly what God did, he made clay and he put spirit into it. And then when he made women, he actually took the DNA of man and he took out what man had. If you, some of you, the version, as I said to you, remember when Adam was first, it was not Male, he was man, he was mankind. He had man and woman, he was one entity, complete. Then God said, no, it's time that I take some of those traits and make you a helper, that there's two people. Whichever way, whether we use dust, RNA, DNA, water, clay, we need the substance. So then, of course, we as Christians then, of course, say, well, then, that's God. Ask the question, then, who made God? Well, no, God's God. Nobody made him. And you're right. So, so God was the beginning, yet he always had to exist. Because if it was the beginning, you can't just have nothing. Even like I tried to explain to you, if there was nothing, what did the universe grow into? So there couldn't be have absolutely nothing, a so big wall and saying, oh, there I'm God. I'm going to create more of me now. Smaller versions of me. So somehow you've got an entity that was the first existence, but yet always been. And I fed in this in my mind. And I said, that means that if I take 
sort of my mind where it can go that we then can't exist. It's impossible. You cannot have something that's always been around, but yet was the beginning. That's impossible. So that means we cannot exist. We don't exist. Yet here you are listening to me. And that's when I did realize. And that, by the way, that is because I, I prefer logic. Give me, give me understanding of things. Um, I battle sometimes when it comes to my faith site and people just say believe. And, and I'm like, no, I want facts. I'm quite logical. Some guys, if you know, start to jokes and say I'm like a Vulcan. Then I thought, let me try to take logic. And, and sometimes when I did this, I realized it's proven more to me that God exists. Because there's no way if I try to do any type of, I want to call it experiments, or trying to figure out by mathematical systems, if I do it that way, then we can't exist. We just don't exist. I can't even say this is just a dream, because a dream is something. But here we are. And that's when I realized when God just said, I am, the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega. I was in the beginning, yet I was there. I'm here yesterday, today, and forever. Then I started realizing, okay, the first God is light. And then I also remember that God is without time. So now here comes a little question. So people often ask me when it comes down to Jesus, because God created us, it was God, so it was all good. Man sort of fell, and then Jesus came. And that's where I like the word too, and John really picked it up. Because remember, in Genesis 1 verse 1, we hear about God, and God spoke, and the Holy Spirit was there, because he had hovered over the waters. Then John, was, then John in 1 verse 1, it reminded us, well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was talking about Jesus. And he was also trying to explain to us that God and Jesus that they, what we believe as a three-in-one, a trinity God. So although you've got Jesus and he was the Word, he was also God. Just like you had Adam, that was all, and he separated them, made them two. They would, we still come together. We always say, I met you, now you made my life whole. You know that, oh, my best friend, and I'm married, and it's beautiful. Because even we believe that there's something missing of us, and when we come together, we become one. And hopefully try to not have the other one irritate with what they don't like of us and having all our fights. But because God is spirit and so on, not, not only are there three entities, or God broke a part of himself and brought his son Jesus to planet, because they're spirit, they, they can be like three entities that do their jobs, but they're also one. They're basically like Adam and Eve that can literally just melt themselves together again and says, well, I need to be the one, now I'm the one, I need to do what I need to do. Then people, of course, ask me now, you know, what about the, you know, people say that you've got to accept Jesus to go to heaven. What about the people before Jesus? Now I'm going to tingle your brain a bit. You've got to try, I'll try to, I'll try to explain this. I'll explain this in like a story. Um, and it's a TV thing I watched, and I thought they really had a good idea to try to do this. So this was one person that was able to find this beings that is without time. So for me, beings without time is God. And he said maybe to you, I need you to do a thing for me. You're going to be one of my prophets. Great, God. And there you go. You start doing what God asks you to do. But then suddenly you meet Tony. And Tony's like, we somehow test your DNA, but you're like 300 years old. Your time period. What? How did you? And he said, no. God also spoke to me. I went, I was nearly dead, and he healed me. But when I woke up, I was at this timeline. I'm, all my family that's passed away. I used to follow God, and here I am. It's not uncommon for God to just take people. He's done it. He's taken Moses. Nobody ever found. It was Elijah, the other person. And uh, you've got Melchizedek as well. They had no parents in that, and they didn't pass away. But here he's now in your timeline. 
So he automatically thinks, well, God must have brought me here because I'm the first prophet. So you must say, listen, I, I, I've been before you as the prophet. And you say, well, as far as God selected me as the prophet that I must train. And he's like, no, 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 no. You, you, I was the first one. Maybe because I went missing, God chose another person. But I'm back. I'm here. I'm, I'm going on with my role now. And then you guys decide, well, let's ask God about this. And then you talk to God and says, well, you brought him now from 300 years ago. And, and God's like, hey, 300 years ago, sorry, you don't mean now. Because I don't need to work in time. At the same time, I asked you to do something. I asked him at the same time, but I maybe wanted him to help you. And then he might say, no, but you sent me 300 years before. And he's like, no, I sent it to you guys at the same time. In my world, maybe in your time limit, you're 300 years behind him. But where I am, I'm here now, all the time, of all time, everywhere. So when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross in the beginning, and he's still dying on the cross in the future. Because when they live something, they live it now and always, all the time. So it's as if God, even when he creates the universe, he's creating it now, he created it in our understanding, however long you want to believe into it, but in God's time, he might have created the universe just now, and he's still creating it. The people are like, oh, why 13 billion light years? Such a long time. No, for God it was now. That's why the Bible always sometimes talk and say, you know, uh, a day to us, it's like a thousand years to God. And again, we are, what, we are scared to talk about timelines because, yo, that's, that's too long. Billions of years and billions of sizes. Again, stop trying to put God into your timeline. And that's why Jesus can forgive the people or be by them and say, choose me now. Because I've died for your sins, not just 2,000 years ago. Because the day I died for the sins, that cross and death I've even felt in the beginning of time too. And that's why, and I think when they must have come together and God said, I'm going to create humanity. But sadly, as we're building it, we already saw the end. Some is not going to always follow. But what an amazing thing that uh, some people sometimes complain, why did God make me and so on. Imagine you just didn't exist. This world, this universe, never heard about your name, your name, your name, your name, your name. You just never were. Even me the, saying the word never actually already has substance. You were less than never. And God decided with all the flaws and all the nonsense, and even Jesus that will have to die on the cross, still said with all its flaws, it is still special enough to make you and you in existence. You are a little bit more special in God's eyes than you think you are. I'm nothing. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. God does. Nobody likes me. Sadly, with Facebook users these days, because I got used to so much. I had 5,000 friends, left, three left. What did I do wrong? I just want to, you know, I, I just want to go. Never mind the 4,993 other people. Isn't it also funny as humans, we tend to rather focus on God and what he created. Everything was good. God created said it was good. He made it was good. He made the humans and said it was good. And every time I laugh, when you get in a fight, what happens? We, you often say that I've done like a hundred things right. And you're fighting with me with the one thing I did wrong. Sometimes people can be the good thing. And I say, I say you know, do you remember Kwesi? Kwesi, Kwesi, yeah. No, man, a guy, he always helped people. And, yeah, okay. Cause, yeah, man, you know, and he always went to schools and prayed for people. Oh, yeah. oh but yeah, sadly, he got divorced like three years ago. Oh, that pussy. Our brains remember everything in the negative form. And that's why Paul also says, spiritual warfare is in your mind. Renew your mind. Focus your mind. Get your mind right. If you're going to focus always on the bad and the sad things, that is what's overpowering you. If you believe that your house is haunted all the time, you will see the ghosts. And I'll have to come and pray for them. And sadly, I don't do it because I've said to people, I'll come and pray for the house, but then I'm going to cancel it too so that you can change the way that you allow the spirits to be there because it's purely by your thought and mind. 
Because Jesus said he defeated Satan. Satan said, but it's got no power over you unless the power you give over him. You can take anything that's bad and you can make it good. Because like I said, God took chaos and he created order. Now we don't always understand why negative and chaos has to exist in order. But there's something that works together in a physical world. That galaxy that you saw, that big one, Nana, in the middle of it's a massive black hole. A black hole is not a nice thing. They consume. Even light consumes. And it thinks, I'm winning. Even light, I've got it. Even like Jesus, when he died, Satan said, I've got him. I took that word. I took a piece of Jesus. I took, and I'm going to try to keep him down there. But what you don't know when it comes to black holes, or like they call those massive black holes, they absorb. And they absorb matter. And they think, yeah, I've got it. Just like Satan. Revelations remind us that Satan thinks he's going for it. But he's going to lose. Because just like a black hole even, it consumes. Then which it can't take up anymore. And it actually, you can call it's got a punch in its side. And it's quite amazing. You, you get some of them. And it suddenly spews all those billions. I think it says can uh, absorb about 500 million suns before it starts filling up. It starts spewing out all that energy. And it starts creating circle. That's why galaxies look the way they do. And it spews of all the matter and life comes into existence again. Sons getting born. And it's exactly like Jesus. He went down. Satan says, come into my black pit. I've got you now. He's been doing that for humans how long? 4,000 years or whatever before Jesus died. Took everything. Tried to take everything. And then Jesus came and said, I'm the tipping point. And it just, bah, a new creation. Jesus brought life. It's quite deep, this, isn't it? <laughs> So I just wrote here, God's actions in creation help us understand how He approaches our lives and the ways He can help us today. For God still brings clarity to confusion. He replaces this organization with organization. And I don't think He's talking about your house being in a mess. This is all, because <laughs> I really like order, by the way. Uncertainty is replaced by certainty. Chaos is replaced by order. Those who are aimless are given his plans. Emptiness is replaced by meaning and purpose. I think especially now we need it more. These last two years and we see families going that, whether it's natural or by the COVID, it has been a hard place for a lot of people, when it comes even with work and all the circumstances. Roger, focus your life and let Jesus give you purpose because you can keep on moaning about it. Guess what? Tomorrow's still going to come. It depends on what mindset you allow to go into that. Allow that black hole to just consume all the time or get your point and say, no, I'm stepping out now. I'm creating new life. Because Jesus said, didn't Jesus just say, if you have a faith like a mustard seed, not only can you do but you can do greater works. Jesus has never been jealous. You know, in the world, sometimes you teach somebody to do something and maybe start doing a bet. I'm like, you know, you know, I'm supposed to be the master here. Where Jesus is like, I wish you could. I, I just remember you've got a, a God that's, that's been in the beginning. He's been at the end and he's there all the time. All, and, then, and he was he allowed to live a fraction of his life to come to earth and sit in this time paradox. But he was still spirit. Because think about it twice. They said they weren't happy what Jesus said. And they start throwing with stones. And he just walk away. If you understand stoning. Or like we in modern day say rock concerts. When they decide to stone you. You don't just walk out of it. You see Jesus was still spirit. He could just move on. When Jesus needed to, he just walked on the sea. So although he was mad, that he was still God. But he allowed you for a fraction of a pinprick of what we understand timeline to experience what we experience. And then to show Satan, firstly, it can be done. As a human, I can live right. I can live clear. And I can defeat death in my human form. That's where focus should be. And the more you can focus on that, Really, your life gets better. 
There's some churches that won't invite me. Because although no spiritual warfare is a real thing, my focus is not on that. I'm not here to come and try to find a spirit, I don't know, of too much coffee and I don't know. And then there's all the time you have to pray for people all the time. Because firstly, we need demons. And it's like we invite demons to be all the time because I need them to pray for all the time. And it becomes a whole show game thing in that. And it does happen. There is people walking with evil spirits. But when they walk into that door, I believe that the blood of Jesus is over each one of us. And as we hear it's in this building. And as I saw in Jesus' time, when, when Jesus arrived and was an evil demon or something, it manifested. And Jesus dealt with it. Klar, period, finished. I'm not talking with you. I'm not having a conversation with you. Oh, son of God, have you come to persecute us already? Jesus basically in modern terms told it, shut up and go. Shh, don't need to talk to you. Besides, not for me to know, only my God knows. And yet we still preach. Hours I've worked at the time. 2020, 5th of January, Jesus is coming. And yet when that question was asked by his disciple, Jesus said, I don't even know about God alone. So what do you think makes you that special that God won't tell his son, but will tell you? But he told you, the signs are there. Be careful for false prophets that might turn away what my word is. And, and why I'm going this way? Because you're going to start asking me, okay, what's that got to do with creation? Every word of God is creation. Because when God says, it becomes. When God gave out Genesis 1 verse 2 and he said, let there be, it came in existence. So by changing the words to, to, to make us feel better, you change some of the words so that you can fill in more in the modern times. Although it says, be careful for the false prophets. They will do miracles. They will heal. Maybe we should stop looking at miracles people and follow in the word. Even said, a guy came and Jesus says, I don't know you. He says, but I did in your name. I, I did all the miracles. Yeah, I used the power of the word, God's word. That's why he was healed. But I don't know you. And I see it more and more today. Whether it's the churches or it's groups and people start liking to have this power grab, they will bend everything. Yeah, we know Bible says, but Jesus understands. You can go on with your stuff here. Just, just, just please, we need those beautiful. It looks good on camera. It looks good on my thick page. Celebrity pastors, I call them. I'm not interested in being a celebrity pastor. I'm not going to change the word to make you feel better, but yet I know I'm messing with your soul. Because every word of God here is what created life, and it actually does work. Every time, like I said, we moan because God has done bad things to us now and that, and it's like, well, um, have you followed God's word to the latter? Or sometimes as a group of people. Because remember too, I said, where there's, when a group comes together, there's power. So we bring in God's power and unity and let him be with us, or we come as a group and moan about everything, and that's the power we allow to start Vesper into this area. And that's why I'm just focused. I'm like, fine, fight your demons. I'm focused on Jesus. If something comes, I'll pray. I'll cast out Satan. He's not going to get in that door and just walk and sit and only going to manifest later because the blood of Jesus is here. And every time a demon saw the blood of Jesus, it manifested instantly. If it comes and manifests, we'll pray for, for him. Cast the demon out. I ask be a bit too busy focusing on God's word, on his creation. Because here comes the amazing thing. You were part of that creation. And it's amazing when he's made everything else. And he made sure everything was perfect. And all the plants were there. Then he put you there. God didn't put you here to always suffer. God didn't put you in the beginning and sort of says, okay, now the plants I'm going to grow. But while they grow, you're going to still see, I don't know, as creation happening, you must jump around because rocks are still moving here and there. God didn't put us in harm's way when he made creation. God made it all and then put us here. And then, like I said, humans went a bit offline. Jesus came back and says, I will take all the scales again and I will give order. And on that note this morning, I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes. And I'm going to sit here too. <clears throat> Sorry for the camera. I think it's time just to 
we still allow too much chaos all the time around us and we battle to find that moment of peace where we can allow God to talk to us. This is what meditating is about in God. It's, if you say, I'm casting my burdens onto Jesus, then believe in that. Cast your burdens onto Jesus. Then say, Jesus, I'm just trying to give you a time whether it's once a week or eventually as I get used to it more, to focus again like I should. The world's been very good to make us, even even I think if you look at our older people, we were able to focus on a job, three, four, six hours, maybe build a gate like Tony. But now most of the times we can do it for about 25 minutes and quickly go check on our phone, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, look at a link. This world is finding an amazing way to distract us. And this also distracts us when it's our focus on Jesus. And this is a moment to just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm close my eyes. And this is why I'm here. I'm here to worship you because of what you've done. But I'm also here to listen, to hear you. What do you want from me? Life is chaos. Things are bad. It's, it's not easy. Even for me, sometimes you come here, it's hard. Petrol's expensive. It's just, I can find all the excuses. But allow God to. To say, I, I, I took, I literally took a whole galaxy that was in chaos and I put order into it. What, don't you think I'll do so much more for you? I, 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 I feed, I, I feed the birds. They're free, they can fly. I, it's because they just believe in me and I feed them. How much more will I do for you? God created this whole universe so that on this measly little planet that looks like a, not even a pinprick, a pinprick of a pinprick of a pinprick in this universe. And yet it's got intelligence. God put and he breathed the spirit into this dust and he made me and you. Gave us life. He's done this all for you. If they didn't make it for humans, then Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit would have just left on this planet. There'd be nobody else. He actually did this all so that you can experience God, creation, matter, energy. That's how special you are. So thank you, Lord, that we can just come here this morning and just bring ourselves to you, Lord. We are the living temples. We are alive. We are your creation. Just say thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can just come together. Thank you that you've made everything so that we can share in your glory, in your light, in your I am. And as we also just go away this morning, that we'll just remember what we are. That we'll find ways, although the world's so negative, that we'll just put you first and just focus on you. Because you are the king, you're the creator of everything. And so as we again go this morning, I just ask that you will bless each and every one here, Lord. That you will go with them, Lord. When I go and speak to the families, they're like, wow, there's just something else of you. It's like you changed. You just, you, I can see that smile is back. And I ask you this all in Jesus' name. Amen.